Have you ever heard of a preacher called Leonard Ravenhill? Well, he's actually one of my favourite preachers. And Ravenhill once said this. He said, I believe one of the most challenging pages of the whole of the Bible is that white page which divides the Old from the New Testament. It's a white page, but it tells of a period of 400 years of total darkness, 400 years of silence without any prophetic voice. And it's from that context of darkness that John the Baptist was called, and that's what we're going to think about today, the brief evangelist. I wonder if I ask you, how long was John the Baptist a preacher for? How long did he have in ministry? What would your answer be? It was actually just six months, just half a year to make an impact with his message that God had given him. Here's another question for you. Are we to imagine you and me, we sit down and we're doing one of those Bible quizzes. Come on now, we've all done it, haven't we? We've all sat down and we've done one of those Bible quizzes where a pastor or a Christian teacher, they say, come on, see, let's, let's test your Bible knowledge. Well, imagine now we're sitting down and the question on the paper is this. Who was the greatest man? Who was the godliest man ever born of a woman? What would your answer be? Maybe you might say, well, Abraham, he was a pretty godly guy. Or the Apostle Paul, you can't get much godlier than him. Maybe you'd say Spurgeon, John Wesley. Well, who did Jesus, the Son of God, say the godliest person ever to walk earth was? Well, in Matthew 11, verse 11, it says this, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that very interesting? So let's study this man who God said was the greatest man ever to walk this earth. So really, there's one thing I want to hammer home in this message, and it's this. You can achieve a lot in just six months. It doesn't matter whether you're young, it doesn't matter whether you're old. As long as God has granted you six more months on this earth, he can do amazing things through you. And John the Baptist is very strong evidence of that. I'd like to break this message up into four little chunks. Four chunks of what it was. What is it that made John the Baptist so special? Why did God use this man so mightily? Well, the first reason is this. He was a man who was sent. The second reason is he was a man of solitude. The third reason is he was salty. And the fourth one is he was self-denying. Okay, firstly, John was a man who was sent. John chapter one, verse six says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, it's super important to remember that John the Baptist was sent for a very, very particular time. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He was sort of the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was sent to make straight the paths of the Lord. John the Baptist was a herald. Now, what does a herald do? A herald is a messenger for the king. And basically, what they were supposed to do is they would go before the king and say, the king is coming, the king is coming and sometimes they'd even get involved with very practical jobs like they'd make sure that the roads were even for the king's arrival so here's this man this man sent of God John the Baptist and he had this super privilege that he was going to prepare the roads prepare the way tell everyone the king is coming for the son of God King Jesus to arrive on the scene and preach the good news to the poor to the world and to die for sinners I don't know if this question ever kind of enters into your mind but do you ever think I wonder what some of these guys in the Bible look like you know we never read that John the Baptist was a handsome man we know that David was King David was a, a ruddy man he was handsome Joseph I mean I'm quite fitting to talk about this right now but we hear that Joseph was a handsome man as well we never hear that John the Baptist was an academic you know how Paul very intelligent man you have to be intelligent to write the book of Romans don't you no, what do we read rather? That, that John the Baptist was actually quite an ordinary man, but he had an extraordinary calling. He was a man sent by God. Now, it's crucial to understand there are two types of calling. There's this sort of general call where God calls every single person who's put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all called to spread the gospel. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. So if we are to be obedient Christians, we're all called to, to get this good news out that Jesus died for sinners and he rose from the dead. That's what we need to do. And I'm guessing that's why some people are on this call 
course now because you want to learn how to be effective at sharing the gospel. But then there's a second type of calling. There's a particular call where God lays a burden on a man or woman's life where they say, I'm just going to give everything, my whole life, to preaching the word of God. I'm just going to give my whole life to preaching the gospel. And again, I wonder if there's someone watching this right now who's thinking, yeah, I've been thinking about full-time Christian work, full-time ministry. Well, that's what John's job was. He was a man who was sent to purely get this message out about the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just stop there for a minute and remember this one key point. If we want to achieve anything in the Christian world, if we want to do anything for God, we must be a man, we must be a woman sent by God. We can't do anything on our own. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. And we have to believe that with every fibre of our being, that without him we're just hopeless. Because the fact is this guys, the moment you and I think the power's in me, you know, I've got this, I can do this in my own strength, that's the moment that we will fail at doing the work for the kingdom of God. May I say something a little bit controversial? I believe one of the scariest things that can happen in the Christian world today is that there could be men and women who are doing Christian work, who are doing the Lord's work, but they were never sent by God. They sent themselves. Jeremiah spoke about these prophets, these prophets who they ran, they ran, but God did not send them. Ezekiel spoke of false prophets who said, they'd go out and they'd say, thus saith the Lord, but God himself said, I did not put that word in their mouth. You see, the proud send themselves, but the humble are sent by God. Now, you might have noticed something quite interesting about my backdrop. I thought, you're probably wondering, when are you gonna get to the point and tell us where are you, Joe? Well, I'm actually in the middle of the wilderness. Well, I'm not really, I'm actually in a field uh, in Preston, just behind my, my house. But the point is this, here's this man, John the Baptist, and he really was, he was in the wild, he was in the wilderness, he was in the desert, and here are these myriads of people, big crowds are following him into the wilderness to hear this man preach a message straight from God. Now why is that so interesting? Because if God has a message through you, people will travel thousands and thousands of miles to hear you speak. But the fact is this, if there is no message from God in you, the person next door, he won't even listen to you speak. A wiser man than me once said this, no one has to ever advertise the fact that there's a building on fire in town. Why? Because when something's on fire, everyone can see it, everyone knows. There's a sort of attractiveness to fire that draws people's attention. And so it is with you and I. If we get set on fire by God, people will know about it. And right now, let's be honest, right now in these strange, uncertain times, in this wilderness, perhaps we could call it the coronavirus, of lockdown, these weird times that we're in, how we need men and women who are set on fire by God, who have got that message of hope, of the risen Lord, who can save sinners and give people a hope beyond the grave. Okay, let's go back to our Bible quiz again. I want you to imagine on the paper it says now, if there was one Christian saint in the whole history of Christianity, which saint would you most like to meet? Do you know who I'd really quite like to meet? George Whitfield. I myself, I love open air preaching. I'd love to hear this man, George Whitfield, preach. You know, it's said about George that when he was a young man, just 22 years old, he'd go and preach in fields like this. And again, there would be literally thousands of people who'd come to hear him preach. In fact, there'd be canal boats that would get into queues so that they could stand on the canal boats and listen to him. There'd be horses and carriages and they would sort of get into traffic jams all the way on these tiny little country roads just to hear this young man preach the message of the gospel. Just this last summer, me and my wife Emma went on actually the best holiday we've ever been on in our lives. We went to a place called the Isle of Lewis. When I told my friend Roger that I was going to the Isle of Lewis, he said, you need to know one name to sort of be accepted on that island. And it was this name, Duncan Campbell. So I had a little research, a little look about what was this man all about? And Duncan Campbell is the man who preached and then revival started on the Isle of Lewis, on this tiny little island in the Scotland Hebrides. 
So how did it all get started? Well, in the 1950s, Christianity was very, very low on the Isle of Lewis. And there was a group of Christians who got quite down about it. In fact, there was one minister and he did everything he could to try and get the young people in uh, to, to hear the gospel. He would put on barbecues, he'd do youth rallies, he'd do all these events, but no one would come in. So one elderly woman, knocked on the pastor's door and said, you know, I've got a message for you, Mr. Minister. The Lord's told me that you've tried everything else, Mr. Minister, but you haven't tried one thing. Why not try prayer? So this minister, who was, you know, quite a humble man, said, yeah, let's listen to this elderly lady from the congregation. I think we need to start praying. So a small group of leaders, of elderly men in the church, they met in barns and they kneeled in the straw and they pray for months and months, Lord God, save this island. Lord God, bring revival. And one night, the Spirit of the Lord came down and met with the people. And just a couple of days, a couple of weeks after, Duncan Campbell came and he preached on that island and there was great revival. And to this day, when we were on that island, it blew us away. There was churches on every corner. In fact, I counted within five minutes, there was five good evangelical churches uh, within just five minutes drive from one another. And then in my own country, England, there's a church at the very top of the north of England in a place called Cumbria, called Little Broughton. And I've got the privilege of going to preach there. There's literally just 10 people and uh, the, the youth congregation are in the 70s. So the youngest person, I think he's like 75. But I love chatting to those people because they've got great stories. And they told me about uh, a guy who owned a lot of lorries, a lot of big trucks, a man called Eddie Stobart. And what Eddie used to do, is he'd hire these big barns, again in the rural countryside, again in the wilderness, and he would invite a preacher, a man called Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, to preach in these barns. And again, thousands of people would come out into the wilderness, come out into these rural places to hear this doctor preach the message of God. So what are you trying to say here, Joe? My point is this. If God's in it, it doesn't matter how busy people are, it doesn't matter what's on television, what people have got in their diary, if God's in it, then people will travel many, many miles into the wilderness to hear a man sent by God. And there seems to be such an emphasis on evangelists with miracles today. And look, come to hear this evangelist preach and he'll heal you. Come to hear this evangelist preach and, and you'll see this miracle, that miracle, you'll be slain in the spirit. All these, there's, there's just this huge emphasis on miracles. But here we have John the Baptist, the greatest man who was ever born of a woman. And did John the Baptist do any miracles? Well, it says in John chapter 10, verse 41, that's your answer. John did no miracles. Now, please don't get me wrong. Miracles are important. And me and Emma in our own life have seen what some people might call small miracles, amazing things that have happened. But our emphasis really as evangelists shouldn't be miracles. It should be preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be John's message, which he repeated over and over again. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That should be what we should be emphasizing. Christ, the one who took the weight of our sins on the cross, the one who can sh who shed his blood to wash us whiter than snow. And that's really what all men, all women who are sent by God have in common. They emphasize one thing, the savior of the world. Well, as you can see, I'm no George Whitfield. There aren't vast crowds coming to listen to me preach. So I'm gonna go inside before I catch a cold. Okay, number two. He was a man of solitude. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 says this, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I want everyone now to use your imagination. And I want you to pretend you're not listening to a Christian message anymore. You are listening to a seminar on how to be healthy and how to live a very long life. And I, as your speaker, open the message by saying this. If you want to be healthy, if you want to live a long, long life, there are two things you need to do. The first thing is, you need to eat more fruits and vegetables. And the second thing you need to do is you need to exercise. Okay, and with that, the talk is over. Goodbye. And you kind of think, is that it? Is that it? But it's true, isn't it? It's really that simple. It's that basic. If you want to be healthy, eat more vegetables and do more exercise. 
Now how do we apply this to what we're thinking about today? Well, it's very simple. If you want to be used by God, there are two things you need to do. You need to spend much, much time in prayer and you need to spend much, much time alone with God. It's really that simple. But you say to me, come on, Joe, give me a silver bullet. Come on, give me some juicy strategy of how we can be more effective in the kingdom of God. And what, what do we do? As Christians, we spend our time wading through book after book, listening to podcasts, listening to YouTube sermons, trying to find some new genius hack, some new tip, a way of winning more souls. But the simplistic fact, the, the raw fact of it is, the way to be used by God is to spend much time in prayer and to spend much time alone, just you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm by no means bashing reading Christian books or going to conferences. I myself love doing that and I get a lot and I learn a lot. But we've got to remember is these things, they're just supplements. And if I put a plate full of vitamin D, vitamin C supplements on your dinner plate, it's not going to be enough to fill you, is it? And that's the same thing. We must never use these things to, to be our main course. The main course is time alone with God. I mean, think of John the Baptist. He spent so much of his life alone with just the bees and the locusts to keep him company. There he was in the wilderness with God. And God in those years was training John, using him, shaping him, moulding him into the evangelist that he was going to use so greatly in those six months. You know, some of the greatest men and women that God has used in this world have also been some of the loneliest men and women. You need to know this. A man of God does not spring up overnight. Oh yes, we might see the ministry. It might seem like his ministry becomes public all of a sudden. But what you haven't seen is the many years of quietness, of discipline, where the Lord God had been training this man, had been training this woman for ministry. The Lord has a lot to teach a minister of the gospel before they go out. This man, this woman has to learn not to be puffed up with pride. They have to learn not to be influenced by other people to only care what God thinks. They have to be hard-working and not lazy. They have to be slow to speak. They have to be fearless. They have to not be a respecter of persons. Kings and beggars are the same in their eyes. There's a lot that goes on in the quietness. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we don't see in those years that God is using to train that man or woman to make them effective for ministry. Oh my dear brother, my dear sister, if you and I want to be used by God, it very often is a very hard road to walk. We might be like John the Baptist, hidden for years and years, and then all of a sudden God calls us into ministry and he uses us mightily. And if you have been trained by the hand of God, you can achieve more in six months than a church achieves in 60 years of their evangelistic work. Now, I do wonder if there's someone listening now and they're thinking, Joe, you're being a little bit over-optimistic, aren't you? You know, you're painting this picture of hundreds of thousands of people getting saved. And you probably are right. That isn't what happens to the vast majority of us. The majority of us, uh, if we're privileged enough, we get to preach to, to four people uh, on a good day, maybe in the open air, perhaps at an, an, an old person's home. We get to speak to a crowd of non-believers. And that, if that happens, we're really blessed. And, and you know, ministry is a slog, and most of the time it's not glamorous. Most of the time it, it's really quite tough. But the point I'm trying to drive home, whether we speak to big crowds or if we speak to one person, the main thing is that we need to be spending time in quiet, sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed that the Bible is often ordered in a particular manner to teach us a very important lesson? Do you remember in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus sent out the 72 and they went out and they healed the sick, they cast out demons, they preached the gospel. And then do you remember what happens in the middle of Luke chapter 10? It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And here's this, uh, this man, he falls by the wayside and the Good Samaritan comes and he, he puts him on his donkey, he takes him to a hotel, he looks after him, he cares for him. 
So there's all this activity, but then how does Luke chapter 10 close? It finishes with Mary sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Now, why is that so interesting? That's interesting because, in other words, God is saying to us, you can't cast out demons, you can't preach the gospel, you can't heal the sick, you can't look after the poor, you can't do all of this activity if you miss the one thing which energises you. At your very epicentre, you need to spend time worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to spend time sitting at his feet and learning from him. You see, in the contemporary Christian world, we often have this idea that the more activity we're doing, the fuller our diaries are, the more effective we are for the kingdom of God. But what do we hear about the Lord Jesus? So often in the Gospels, he withdrew from the crowds. He, he snuck away to get alone with God because he knew the power was unlocked by spending time alone with his Father in heaven. I do think that the devil loves it when we're busy. You know, the devil loves it when we're always in a hurry. He wants us to get to that place where we're in such a rush that we're too busy to pray. He knows how many revivals have started from a few old people gathered together in a room alone saying, Lord God, unless you give me Scotland, I will die. Unless you bring revival to America, I will die. Please, Lord, rend the heavens, send revival down and, and cast your love upon this people. The devil knows that there is a power to silence. He knows that that verse, be still and know that I am God, is so true, it's so powerful, and he'll do everything he can to stop us from getting to that point where we get on our knees and seek the Lord's face. So come on now, talk to me. What have your quiet times looked like this last week? Are you doing the most dangerous thing that a Christian can do? Are you spending much time in prayer? Are you giving God the very creme de la creme of your day? Or are you giving him the sort of cigarette butts, as Spurgeon said, just a bit of time here, squeezing a bit of a quiet time here, you know, this lockdown has given us, the vast majority of us anyway, it's given us a lot more extra free time. And what have we done with that time? Have we frittered it away watching television, spending much time on social media or on Netflix? Or have we really got to know the God who saved us? We mustn't cheat the Lord Jesus of our devotion. We must give him the best because Jesus deserves the best. Again, here's a quote, and I don't know who, who came up with this quote, but it goes like this. Of what use is it to have many irons in the fire if the fire is going out? Of what use is it to have many irons in the fire if the fire is going out? Number three, John the Baptist was salty. Matthew chapter three, verses seven to eight say this. But when he saw, that's John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. But there's one thing John the Baptist wasn't. John the Baptist was not a coward. He was as bold as a lion. And no one could say that his salt had lost its flavour. He was a salty, salty guy. And he did not mince his words. A.W. Tozer said, God calls us sheep, but he doesn't call us mice. Not long after I got saved at 19 years old, I was a little bit nervous, a bit apprehensive on going on a short-term mission. In the UK, we have these things called beach missions, where we take the gospel out onto the beaches and we teach children the Bible and we do open air preaching. And really, it's just a, a very blessed time, a way of sort of training and learning the way uh, to, to witness effectively. And I was quite nervous about going on my, my first beach mission. So my friend, a man called Vinnie Commons, decided I'll drive Joe and I'll, I'll make sure he settles in on beach mission. So he stayed for the first three days while we went out and, and reached people on the beaches of a place called Landudno in Wales. And I remember one night in particular, we'd been preaching in the open air and I was talking to an elderly woman and I was sharing the gospel with her and it was going quite well. 
And Vinny was sort of eavesdropping, he was listening to the conversation. And at the end of the conversation, Vinny just took me aside and he said this, Joe, never be afraid to look an old person in the eye and say, if you die tonight, are you sure that you're going to heaven? And that was a big, big learning curve for me because I learned there's a real value in being very straight, being very bold at times and telling people the truth. May I ask you a personal question? What is the sin that you really do struggle with? If there was one sin which kept coming up, returning to you over and over again, what is it that you struggle with? So just quietly in your mind now, think of it. Have you got it? Let me tell you what mine is. I struggle with the fear of man. You perhaps wouldn't believe this, but I'm pretty insecure. I want people to like me. I want, after I've done something well, I want people to say, that was a good job, well done. You did a really good job there. Now why is that so dangerous as a preacher to be like that? I'll tell you why. Because you can end up changing, you can end up twisting the message to try and please the people. You can end up tickling the ears. Now something reassuring to know is this. John, John the Baptist was the complete opposite to that. He didn't tickle ears, he clipped ears. Do you remember this? Where, where all these Pharisees, they came up to him and they said, we want to be baptised. And what did John say to them? He said, you're a brood of vipers and Jesus is going to come with an axe and he's going to cut you down. That was brave. That was bold. He wasn't like one of these evangelists who says, tonight we had a hundred decisions for the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I led 10 people to the Lord. We had the baptism pool open and 20 people got baptised. He wasn't trying to make a, a big scene and, and big, a big eye pleaser for everyone to see. No, John wanted true repentance because he knows that God sees right through our fakery. He sees right through our false veneers and he sees the heart whether a man or woman really is born again and really does love the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another example of John's courage. Do you remember Herod, the most powerful man in the land and he's having an adulterous relationship? So what does John do? Does he sit back? Does he ignore it? No, he boldly denounces that sin and says, it is not lawful for you to have that woman as your wife. You are sinning right now. And it cost him. It cost John the Baptist his head. His head was brought out on a platter. Mark my words, if you and I in 2020 stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we stand up for righteousness, it will cost us, it will cost us greatly. And again, to quote Leonard Ravenhill, he said, boy, we could do with some men who are willing to lose their heads for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, I want to make something abundantly clear. John did not just emphasize repentance. In fact, he emphasized the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything else. Look at, if you've got a Bible there, just turn to John chapter one. And look at verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then what does John do? He repeats this same message like a good evangelist. He repeats the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 36. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then if you look at verse 7 of John 1, it says, this man, talking about John, came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that through him they might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now again, I want to make something so clear. I really do believe there is a time and a place for us as evangelists, as ministers of the gospel, for us to name sins. We are to tell people to forsake their evil ways, to turn from their sins and to turn to God in repentance. But I do believe the emphasis of our message should be the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to point people to the light. A couple of years ago, I treated my wife to a 300 pound holiday in the Canary Islands in a place called Tenerife. 
So here we are, we, we get off the plane, I booked it uh, through this company called Ice Lolly, which had been around for about two minutes, and we stayed in a two-star hotel. As we arrived there, we couldn't open the door, there was paint crumbling off the walls, probably asbestos that were breathing in. It was quite a hotel, really. And I remember, quite specifically at night, we couldn't sleep, there was no air conditioning. And we'd wake up in the middle of the night, and if we needed the bathroom, we'd turn the light on, and there on the floor were these things that we don't get in the UK, these things called cockroaches. If there's someone watching now who gets cockroaches in their house or around their area, just let me know. But I've never seen a cockroach before. So here we are, we turn the light on, and in front of these cockroaches, but here's what's very interesting. What happened as soon as that light went on? The cockroaches scuttled away into the darkness. And so it is when we preach the gospel of Christ, when we turn on the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we preach him, suddenly it exposes men and women's darkness. It exposes their sin naturally. So you don't have to go to that emphasis all the time because you just need to preach Christ and that alone will bring people to a conviction of their own sin. Lift up the light and men will see just how dark their hearts really are. Now before we move on, just have a look at verse 14 of John 1. It's talking about Jesus and it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now if there's one practical thing we should take away from this message, I think it's those two words. As evangelists, as people who take out the gospel, we must always hold that tension that we need to be full of grace and full of truth. Proverbs 3 verse 3 reminds us that we need to bind mercy and truth around our neck. Why is that? Why do we need both of them? Well, we've all seen uh, the, the street preacher on the streets and he's screaming at the top of his voice, that skirt's too short, the way you're dressing is, is, is ungodly, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. He's full of truth, no one can deny that he's telling the truth, but he's lacking grace. And then on the flip side, however, do you remember Mother Teresa? She was on the streets of Kerala. She saw people poor, broken. She wouldn't let her, she wouldn't walk past someone who was homeless without helping them. No one can deny that woman was full of grace. And yet she was lacking truth, bound up in the lies of Roman Catholicism. But our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, he held that tension there. He was full of grace and full of truth. At times he was sharp, he, he said the words of truth and he, he rebuked people when it was necessary. But at the same time, he was so gracious. When people were cast out, laughed at by the religious hypocrites, Jesus got down on his knees and said, I don't condemn you, neither do I condemn you anymore. So let us remember that in our evangelism, to be gentle and kind, but at the same time, to not be too afraid, to be bold, and speak the truth in love. And fourthly and finally, John the Baptist was self-denying. Look at John chapter one, verse 26, it says this. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. Have you ever wondered why the Bible is so descriptive about the way John dresses, that he was clothed in camel hair and that he ate locusts? Is it implying that you and I should eat bugs to, to reach a higher level of holiness? You know, in my country, there's a, a very popular program called I Am A Celebrity, Get Me Out Of Here. And the celebrities have to do these things called bush tucker trials where they have to eat bugs. Well, John would be a master at that. He, he loved eating locust burgers. He could do it all. But is that what you and I need to do? No. I think what it's pointing towards is that there was nothing rah-rah about this man, John. There was nothing elaborate. He was a simple-hearted man who was contented with the simple things. He wasn't dressing to try and impress anyone. He was just an ordinary man who God used very mightily. Do you know, 
I'd really like one day to do a study, I keep saying I'm going to do this and I will one day, I'd love to do a study of the diet of the Lord Jesus Christ. At times uh, Jesus was called a glutton, that he ate too much, but we often read of him just being content with a piece of bread and some fish and that's what satisfied him. You know, there was a, a simplicity, wasn't there, to Christ, John the Baptist and the disciples. They didn't have Bible college degrees, they didn't have careers, they didn't have big jobs, they didn't have six-figure salaries, they didn't have cars, conferences. But I'll tell you what they did do. They turned the world upside down. And I do think, you and I, we could do with going back to simple things. As I said earlier, prayer, studying the Word of God, and relying upon the Spirit of God instead of all these different things, all of this drama, all of these things that we surround ourselves with in the 21st century, I think we could do with going back to basics. Now, there's one verse which always, always comes to mind whenever anyone says John the Baptist. What is the verse I'm thinking of? John the Baptist once said, He must increase, but I must decrease. And John really, really meant it. You know, it is so incredibly rare to have a, a minister of the gospel, someone who's got a role in the church or a ministry, for them to serve in this office for years and years and years, and then to gladly pass over to a successor, to say, you take my ministry, you do it all, and then them to just fade quietly into the background and everyone to forget about you. That's very rare, isn't it? And yet here is this man, John the Baptist, the most famous preacher in the world, with every eyeball, with all these crowds coming to him, looking at him, all these eyeballs are looking at him, and then Jesus appears on the scene, and John turns every single eyeball away from himself and says, no, behold, the Lamb of God, look at Jesus Christ, and John fades into the background, hidden, for everyone to forget about him. He really was the definition of humility, wasn't he? But what about you? What about me? Is ministry about us? Or are we turning all the eyeballs to the Lord Jesus? One day, the most respectable religious leaders of the city approached John and they asked him this question. Who are you? Are you a prophet? No, I'm not. Are you Elijah? No, I am not. Are you the Christ, the coming Messiah? No, I'm not. Well, who are you, John? I'm just a voice. Just a voice pointing to Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm just a voice. You see, John the Baptist, he didn't want any honour for himself. He didn't want people to look at him. He just wanted people to see Christ and him alone. You see, the mark of a true man of God is that he just wants to get smaller and smaller. He wants Jesus to wear the crown. He certainly doesn't want a crown for himself. George Whitfield once said this, Let my name die everywhere. Let even my friends forget me. If by that means the cause of the blessed Jesus may be promoted. Let me leave you with one final thought. I want you to imagine that behind me is a big, beautiful full moon. And I want you to imagine a man walks up and says, look, there's a moon there, but before you look at the moon, just, just notice my hand. Look how beautiful my hand is. I've moisturized, my finger is beautiful. I've got really lovely hands, haven't I? But yes, by the way, there is a, there is a small little moon there, but look at my hand. And then another man walks up and he points and he says, everyone, look at the beautiful moon. And every eye looks straight at the moon. Who should the Christian, who should the evangelist be, the first or the second? I think we should all be the second, shouldn't we? Let us always take every eyeball off us and point to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he must increase and I must decrease. So, the lesson we can all learn from John the Baptist is that God can bypass all the greats of this world, the greatest Bible scholars, the greatest scientists, the greatest politicians, athletes, the kings, the queens. He can pass all of those people and take a grip of the most ordinary life. 
He can use that man, he can use that woman, and let them preach the gospel with power and might so that souls are won into his kingdom. Can I ask you a question? Do you want to be that man? Do you want to be that woman who was sent by God? Well, it starts with spending much time alone with him. It starts with a quiet time. It starts with prayer. It starts with being not afraid to speak the truth every now and then. And above all, it starts with humility and turning all the eyes off you and saying, Jesus, I want you to be crowned. It's all about you. Thank you for watching. God bless you all.